Conservation and Climate Change Lecture Series. I'm Lori Young. I'm the director of the Wilderness Institute here at the University of Montana. We are one of the sponsors of this series along with the Climate Change Studies program. I'd like to thank the Cinnabar Foundation, the Rick and Susie Fox, the Post Office, and MCAT for their support of this series. And if you're joining us for the first time this week, please know that there are four more lectures after tonight and you can pick up a full schedule on that table behind the television camera on your way out. Next week, Gloria Flora is joining us from Helena. Some of you may, may be familiar with Gloria. She's the Director of Sustainable Attainable Solutions and an inspirational speaker and conservation leader. She's going to be talking about biochar, a solution from the distant past. And with that, we'll get to the main event for the night, which is uh, Hugh Stafford, who has joined us from California. We're very fortunate to have him here to talk with us about fire and climate change. Uh, he'll be introduced by Solomon Dabrowski, Assistant Professor of Landscape Ecology in the, in the College of Forestry and Conservation here at the University. Solomon has worked for many years with Hugh, and he's going to tell you a little bit about Hugh before he provides you. Thank you, Laurie. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I get the honor of introducing Hugh today. Um, basically, I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of formal background of what Hugh does and where he's coming from. And then I'll give a little off-the-cuff remarks about Hugh for the camera on our local television station. Um, so Hugh is a senior vegetation ecologist or regional ecologist for the Pacific Southwest region for the U.S. Forest Service. What does that mean? Basically, Hugh manages um, a group of ecologists that basically provide vegetation and fire expertise, fire ecology expertise, for 18 of um, the national forests that are in California. Um, Pacific Southwest region includes California, it includes Hawaiian Islands, it also includes um, some of the Pacific Islands. He's also a research faculty associate um, with the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at UC Davis. And uh, he, this is somewhat, somewhat of a homecoming for him as well. He got his um, bachelor's at Montana State. We won't hold that against him. In geology, he got a master's in secondary education from San Francisco State University and a PhD in ecology um, at UC Davis. He also likes to point out that he got a PhD in powder skiing at Bridger Bowl. <laughs> um, along with um, his expertise in um, landscape ecology and fire ecology, he also is one of the top experts in um, serpentine ecology, so serpentine endemics in California. He's probably one of the top botanists in California that I'm aware of. Um, his expertise spans a whole range of things. I mean, he's a, um, a renaissance man. If, there ever was one, and he's been a mentor to me in many ways. Um, as a grad student at Davis, he provided a lot of guidance um, to basically link a lot of the research work that goes on in the ivory tower to what managers actually are interested in. Um, that means your about. time's almost up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll wrap this up. He does work for USAID, so spends a lot of time doing international work. Um, the other things that um, some of you may not know, he's also an accomplished pianist. He's played piano at state dinners for Her uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. He has been hit by lightning twice, and he's been arrested on four continents. <laughs> so with that, I'll pass the microphone over to you. Thanks a lot. So, um, my talk will be shorter than that. <laughs> Um, title of my talk, Climate Change, Forests, and Fire Issues in Current and Future Resource Management in the California National Forest. So I'm going to be focusing primarily on, on California as an entity. As Solomon said, I'm actually a Montanan originally. I grew up in Bozeman. Um, I hated the Grizzlies. Uh, <laughs> don't hate them anymore, actually. Don't worry. And um, the, uh, uh, my dad was actually uh, the status, one of the statisticians for the Bobcat basketball team. He's a, he was on faculty at the university th at the same time. Um, but I, if, when it comes to questions, and I'll try to make linkages where I can to uh, situations in California where those sorts of uh, linkages are germane. But if you have questions about what some of this stuff might mean for Montana, I'd be happy to help explore that with you when the talk is over. Um, so what I'm actually going to cover I could talk about a lot of things. I'm going to uh, real briefly cover 
uh, climate trends and projections for California um, uh, in general. Uh, then I'm going to talk about fire trends and projections for California. Um, and then I'm going to focus on ecological implications for resource management of those two uh, trends. Focusing primarily on biological implications, uh, vegetation implications, implications for plant diversity, implications for wildlife habitat. Um, I, I'm not an expert in, in, in carbon cycling. Um, like any ecologist, I know something about it. I'm not an expert in hydrology, really, or, or pedology, either, although like any ecologist, I know uh, something about that. And I just want to note that I'm not going to focus on these factors in my talk, but I also want to note to you that these are extremely, extremely important. And in fact, in terms of really the long-term implications of both climate change and the way that we manage for climate change and the impacts of climate change and our management on humans, these are probably really the really important variables. Certainly within California right now, the real big focus is on water. We've got 30 million people in that state right now. There are going to be 50 million people there you know, in the next 40 or 50 years, and they're going to need water. And almost all that water comes from the national forest system in California, or at least a lot of it that doesn't come from the Colorado River system. And so the way that we manage those systems in the face of climate change is going to have a whole lot to do with how many people are able to get water in the long run. And then I've got some conclusions, obviously. Okay, this climate change stuff, I, I don't know, maybe there's some climate change deniers in the house and we can entertain some questions later if you want to do that. But I'm going to make some assumptions that most people in here understand some of the basic trends and so I don't really want to focus too much on this part of the talk. I'm just going to show you some graphs, set the basis for some of my uh, 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 future comments. So here, here are California mean annual temps. I mean, what exactly is a mean annual temperature for the state of California? I don't know. It's a summary of a lot of different thermograms, you know, thermographs across the state. But you can see that since the early 20th century, uh, if you take a sort of a mean linear trend, it's probably up a couple of degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't seem like a lot to people, but remember that the depths of the last glacial maximum were only about four degrees colder than right now. And it only takes about two degrees to start the planet heading in that direction. So you add two degrees going in the other direction, it's just as a profound a change, but in the other direction. I, live, I spend a lot of time in Lake Tahoe. I live up there in the summer. I, I, I hang out there a lot in the winter. And one of the things that uh, is, is really uh, uh, tragic for anybody who likes to practice um, you know, uh, uh, any kind of uh, snow sports, uh, whether it be skiing or ice climbing or whatever, is that at Tahoe City, you know, you're looking at beginning of last century, about 80 days a year in which the temperature stayed below freezing. Now it's closer to 50 on the regression line. This has major implications, not just ecologically speaking, but economically speaking. Many of the ski areas that are at lake level, their lowest slopes now, they have a heck of a time maintaining slopes on the, uh, snow on those slopes. My guess is that some of the, uh, the local areas will be similar, though of course this year is a little bit of an anomaly. Um, so, uh, these are just a couple of graphs. This is uh, Tahoe City, about 1,900 meters elevation or about 6,200 feet. This is Grants Grove down in Sequoia Kings Canyon uh, National Park. And I just wanted to note another typical pattern. Again, if you guys have studied anything about climate change, you'll know this pattern. And that is that although we talk about mean temperatures going up, in most places that, that we've looked at closely, the pattern is driven very, very strongly by the nighttime temperatures. All right? In other words, the daytime maxima, for the most part, are not changing all that much. Doesn't mean that we're not necessarily going to see more heat waves in the future, but the real change has been in the nighttime temperatures. For example, if you look at the Tahoe City graph, you'll see that, and again, I've just thrown a linear trend on this, maybe that's not appropriate, but we'll just use that for now. You can see that before about 1960, the average nighttime temperature was below freezing. Since 1960, it's gone above freezing, or, or at least it's above freezing now. Um, and that obviously has a lot of profound implications for the amount of snow that stays on the ground, when snow melts, the form that precipitation actually comes in. And this also has some really interesting Im ecological implications. If you think about nighttime temperatures, um, actually, is there precedent for me asking questions of the audience? Can that happen? Anyone want to explore that for me? If nighttime temps are going up, what are the implications for snow melt? Okay, well, we're talking snow melt in the summer, right? So when does snow melt usually happen in the summer? Okay, can start earlier, but snow melt usually happens during the day in the summer, right? If you're at high elevation because it freezes at night, okay? So if you raise nighttime temps, it means you're also melting snow at night. 
as well, all right? And as you melt the snow, you decrease the amount of albedo in the system, right? There's more dark soil, which absorbs more heat. So it's not a linear trend, right? Another thing is deserts. OK, so if you're a critter in the desert or a plant in the desert in the summer, where do you get your water? Let's say you're not in a summer rainfall desert. You, got it, you get it from dew. Exactly. All right. So a whole lot of organisms are adapted simply to retrieving dew that condenses at night. Well, if it's warmer at night, the air holds on in the moisture and it doesn't condense. There's some really interesting studies out of some cooler temperate deserts, particularly in South America, where they've shown really strong impacts on species distributions because of lack of dew formation at night. Another one is fire behavior. Anyone in here work with fire or fire behavior? Nighttime temperatures, when it drops, and the temperature drops at night, what happens to humidities? They go up, right? And so fire behavior, to a great extent, is driven by humidity, by both fuel moistures and by air moisture. And if at nighttime, temperatures are not dropping like they used to, then fires remain active into the evening. And this is a classic pattern that we started to see. I'll put it this way. I started to hear firefighters talking about this around 1999 or 2000, where fires were now burning well into the evening. And we've had a lot of events recently where there were active burn periods straight through the night. This is something that we're not used to dealing with. So one thing that needs to be noted for most of California, which is a little bit anomalous for a lot of the Western US, and one of the reasons why some of our patterns in California may not be all that applicable to, to all of the Western US, is that precipitation has at least been steady for most of the state, and it's actually gone up across a lot of the northern part of the state. Solomon's made that point in a, in a very interesting paper in Science Reel recently, that water balance in most of northern California is positive over the last uh, century, more or less. Um, and so this is something to think about. I'm going to talk about the implications of that in a, in, in, in a minute. OK, so a couple of other patterns that are worth talking about. This is from the Tahoe City Station. And again, I don't know, uh, you know what your familiarity with is just with sort of general climate change projections. But one of them is that with warming ocean temperatures, that you're going to see significantly higher variability in the way that precipitation comes to you. All right? In other words, let's say that your precipitation values stay at a steady mean across a 100-year period. Most of the models are projecting that into the future, although the mean, let's say it doesn't change, the interannual variability is expected to become greater and greater and greater. Well, the fact is, is that when you take a look at most of the stations that we've looked at in California over the last 100 years, it's already happening, and it's clearly happening. This actually, the Lake Tahoe record is not a really good one. I could have picked a, a much better example of this. But all we've done here is we've taken the precipitation records for Lake Tahoe. We've taken five-year running periods, and we've calculated, you know what a coefficient of variation is? You guys don't know what standard deviation is, right? It's a measure of variability. And if you divide it by the mean, you get a standardized measure of variability across the data set, OK? And you can see that for Tahoe City, the variability is increasing over time. And again, like I said, there are some stations where it's quite extraordinary in which, say, the last 20 years we've had not only the five wettest years, but the five driest years you know, in the last hundred have all been in the last decade or two. All right, so that's another pattern. That's an important pattern with really significant ecological outcomes again, right? If you live in a stream, for example, and you're used to a certain mean base flow, well, you can't be used to that anymore. It might be that there are years in which the stream goes totally dry and other years in which you get really strong pulses of water that completely scour the bedrock, right, and clear everyone out of the stream bed. So ecologically, that's important. And then this is just fraction of snow, uh, of precipitation that is snow. And that's also dropping. So although uh, for a lot of Northern California, the amount of precipitation arriving in the state is at least steady, if not increasing, across uh, that portion of the state, the proportion of that precipitation that is coming is more as rain than it is as snow. And I'm guessing that you understand the long-term implications for human water use, right? Because in a place like the Sierra Nevada in California, the biggest reservoir of water is the snowpack. OK? So if you get less snow, it means you need more reservoirs to hold on to the water. And more reservoirs are a big issue, ecologically speaking. Oh, this is actually something I stole from you. Is your name on there? Oh, yeah, there it is right there. Look at that. Whew. Often don't do that. You know, I work for the Fed, so I can steal whatever I want. Uh, so, um, so spatial patterns in temperature and precipitation change. And there you go. So that's cool. And I should have put the water balance, but I wasn't sure people would understand that. But basically, 
Okay, let me just say one other thing. I don't know if you know California, if you like California, if you've ever been there, if you're ever going to go. Um, if you want a job, you're probably going to have to go there someday. Um, <laughs> but uh, don't go now, because there are no jobs now. Um, but uh, see, I was from Montana. I had no choice. I had to go there. Um, but the state is nine and a half degrees of latitude long. If you go from the southern tip of the state, you're in Jacksonville, Florida, and the northern tip is Lake Michigan. Okay, so you cannot do an analysis of some pattern across the whole state of California. It's absolutely impossible, and it's just basically stupid. Okay, so if you see a paper that does that, give me a call, and I'll, send, I'll make a nasty phone call to somebody. Um, but my point is, you see it right here. The northern part of the state has gotten quite a bit wetter. The southern part of the state has gotten quite a bit drier, right? Northern part of the state has seen somewhat increasing temps, although there's actually been decreases in some montane basins in the northern part of the state, really strong increases in temperature in Southern California. These are completely different parts of the United States. And I don't mean not just this way, I mean politically, economically, you name it. Yeah, there was a question? Uh, what did you think about the current snowfalls in Napa with Valley Green? In the, oh, the current snow, oh, just me last weekend. I was so bummed I wasn't there to ski in that stuff. Yeah, no, yeah, no, it's... Get back, get back your snow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, lots of variability, right? But it snows there, actually, about every four or five years. Okay, so there is a Solomon graph. Let's see what's next. Oh, okay. I should have I waited on this, like, California's different, like you didn't know that thing. But this, uh, ooh, the colors aren't great on this. Okay, at any rate, what I wanted to show was that what Solomon's point in this paper, well, one of the important points of this paper that he just wrote in Science was that we have to think not only about rising temperatures, but the fact that species distributions in semi-arid places like the western U.S. are more driven by water availability than anything else, and we should not forget that. All right. So what I did, or I didn't do this, someone I know did this, they took these ecological regions of the United States and they used a data set called PRISM and they just took essentially what Solomon did in the last graph, but they used the period 1960 to 90 versus the most recent period and they just subtracted evapotranspiration from precipitation, which is what we call is one measure of water balance, right? The amount of water available, right, for, for, for uh, biota to use. And all I wanted to show was, Cal yeah, this color just doesn't do it, but if you just take basically anything west of the Rockies at a line here and you go west, what you'll see is Northern California is the, pretty much the only blue place out here. There are a couple other small ones that you can't see, okay? So quite anomalous for the western U.S., but just south of it is by far the place that's had the biggest decrease in water balance in the United States, in the same state. So it's difficult to talk about general patterns across California, so of course that's what I'm going to do today. <laughs> So here's, a, here's winter snowpack, um, and I'm going to ask a little bit about geography here in a second, but basically red circles mean that snowpack is down, and the size of the circle is proportional to how much it's down over this 50-year period. This is from the 1950s until 1997. This is the amount of water in the snowpack, all right? And so what you can see is, it seems incredible, but there are many places in which the snowpack has decreased by over 100% in California in April. Right, so even though precip is up, it's coming as rain. Right, so it, most of it is flowing off the landscape and not remaining to be held. Okay, now who in this room knows why the Southern Sierra has seen an increase in snowpack? And I'm buying you a beer if you tell me. Only if you're over 21, though. Higher elevation. Oh yeah, well I'm going to see you for a beer afterwards anyway. I guess I have to buy now. So Steve says higher elevation. You guys know the Sierra Nevada at all? Okay, this is the highest mountain range down here in the lower 48, all right? Very high plateau, and even though temperatures are warming and frost lines are moving up, it's high enough that even uh, at this point, in fact, I'll show you the projections, and it's still projected to be a, a net gainer for a while, that the increase in precipitation is actually resulting in increased snowpack in the southern Sierra Nevada, which is kind of interesting. My guess is that after 50, 60 more years of this, that's not going to hold up. All right, so I just, real quickly, some of the future projections. All right, more of the same, right? So I'm just showing you data that we have, empirical data, trends that we can document, that we've seen happening, and then these are just some of the future models. Lori, do people in here have a basic background in global circulation models and how we do climate change modeling? You guys know how that works at all? Some people do, some don't. All right, I'll just do it real quickly. So basically, 
every country has its, its own suite of global circulation models, which are these really complicated packages of interlinked models that, that attempt to explain the interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean, right? Because that drives weather, all right? It seems like every country has got its own set of models, just like every country has its own, like, you know, base in Antarctica, right? And uh, so there's like dozens of them, right? IPCC and these other groups use a group of like 16 to 20 of them that has sort of span a range of different kinds of projections. So um, then on top of these different models, which have somewhat different outputs because they make different assumptions, right, and, and they have different mechanics, then there are these things that the IPCC calls emission scenarios. Okay, so in these emission scenarios, which are in the IPCC report, these are actually really more sociological scenarios than anything else. So for example, B1 is the whole world dons white dresses and garlands and holds hands and dances around and never burns any more carbon. Okay, <laughs> highly likely. Maybe if you live in Finland. Um, but A2, A2 is a highly pessimistic scenario, and in fact, it's pessimistic enough that in the IPCC report that they first used the A2 scenario, they kind of hid the results in the back because the pol politicians said, ah, this is a little too alarmist, we don't want people to focus on this. Okay, so the scary part of, is, of course, that A2 is essentially business as usual. I mean, that's the one that has best predicted where things have actually gone since the IPCC reports have come out, and it's the gloom and doom scenario. No one gives a crap. Everyone keeps burning coal. By the way, I was sitting at Fire Lab watching all those coal trains go by out here. That's why you guys are in the black in the budget, right? Isn't that it? All the coal you're selling to the rest of the world? I mean, gee, stop that. You guys are going to be laying on the tracks to stop the coal trains. So at any rate, um, I'd send you money. Um, so, so this is the scary scenario. This is the happy scenario, right? So basically, and these are different uh, models. So let's say this is more real, because that's what all the models suggest. Well, here's California, and here's the projection out, you know, 2090, 2100, and the mean out here is like six or seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is right now. Man, I live in Davis, California right now. I mean, that's where I live, except in the summer, because in the summer, I can't hack it. The mean July high is almost 95 degrees in Davis, which some people like it. I don't get that. I have to flee. I cannot deal with it. And if you add six or seven degrees to that, average high of 100 or 101, you know where that puts me? That puts me in northern Mexico somewhere. I mean, <laughs> Tucson's average high in July is 99.5 or something like that. So what was it in Missoula? What's the average July high? It's probably mid 80s, right? Something like that? OK, so let's say it's mid 90s now. That puts you in central California somewhere. So take yourself, I, I'll, I'll take Davis, OK? It, it's a little easier for me. So if I take Davis and I move three degrees, I'm in Bakersfield. Oh, I don't want to be in Bakersfield for any reason, you know? And then, and then if I add two degrees to that, I'm in Las Vegas. Oh, that's even worse. And then, I, you know, and then I'm in Phoenix. Oh, my God. You know? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that comes along with that temperature thing. Lots of retired people playing golf, no water, you know, 105 degrees every afternoon. That's all coming along with climate change. You know? And uh, it is. But the other thing that comes along with it is, if you stand in Tucson and just do the 360, and I say, okay, so this is what Davis is going to be like in, 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 in 100 years, it's not just the temperature that changed. Everything changed. The landscape looks completely different. You guys ever spent time going down Highway 1 along the Pacific Coast, like into Baja? Anyone ever done that? Just think about driving from Humboldt County to San Francisco to Santa Barbara to San Diego to Ensenada and just keep going. And you are watching climate change happen as you go south. I mean, Ensenada's temperature is San Diego. San Diego is Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is going to be where Humboldt is. And you start looking around at the way that fire works and bugs work and all those things work. That's all coming with climate change. It isn't just temperature, man. It's everything else is coming with it. And here's the future climate snowpack. You know, same thing. Basically, there's no more water available for human use in the north if you don't build a lot of big reservoirs. This is a pretty scary thing because we've already damned everything in California. Okay, so here's the climate summary. It's getting warmer, especially at night. Mean annual precip at, le at least currently appears to be holding steady or rising in the north. It's dropping strongly in the south. Tough to say what the long-term trends will be. We'll have to see. Interannual, inter variability in precip is increasing. 
highs are up, going higher, lows are lower, there's less snow, even though there may be similar precip, the snowpack as a result is much lower. And the combination of these factors is resulting in drier summers. So one thing I want to note that is really the profound difference, ecologically speaking, between California and Montana is the distribution of precipitation across the year. All right. So even though you have a summer in Montana, you actually get most of your precip at the end of the spring and in the beginning of the summer, right? And if you guys ever seen a climate diagram for Missoula or for anywhere in the nor northern Rockies, it's almost flat. The precip has a little hump there in the spring, but you get precip the whole year. You ever seen one for California? We get, the Sierra Nevada gets an insane amount of snow. I mean, it is insane. But then the guy upstairs turns this button off about May 15th, and it does not even precipitate again until like the end of October most years. So we get your 100-year drought every summer. That's a Mediterranean climate. That's what it's about. OK, so in terms of fire, as a result, California is strongly dominated by pyrogenic systems, systems that are adapted to fire, at least in some respect. OK? I mean, some of this I don't need to go over. These are sort of tired old graphs. So some of the trends that we're seeing. All right, since the 1980s, in particular, we're seeing real strong growth in annual burned area, mean fire size, maximum fire size, and in the Sierra Nevada, fire severity as well. And fire severity is a measure of the amount of biomass lost to fire. Okay, so all of those are increasing strongly since the 1980s in the Sierra Nevada. If you go to the Klamath Mountains, which are in the northwestern corner, this is your border Oregon. Same patterns in annual burned area, mean fire size, and maximum fire size, although fire severity doesn't seem to be changing all that much. I'm not going to focus uh, today on why that is. There's some interesting ecological reasons for pr probably for why those patterns are happening, but I'm not going to spend any time on that. So um, this one, every time I, I see this graph, I always think of Al Gore, you know, and that cherry picker thing going up there with a the carbon dioxide graph. Don't worry, I'm not going to channel Al Gore, okay? <laughs> um, but uh, there's not, this is not a coincidence, all right, that in the starting here in the 80s, we start to see a real clear and strong breach of sort of this previous range of variability. And it's not a coincidence that that happens to tie pretty closely to a lot of the trends we see across the West. And this isn't just in California. You see a number of papers looking at West-wide changes in fire behavior, fire frequency, fire activity. They all tend to just all of a sudden leave all previous bounds of variation in about the 1980s. So, but the other thing I want to note is, okay, that's fine. Lots of people have done lots of analyses that show that. Okay, so what? Other things that you should not forget is that there is a really strong signal of fuels in, some, in, in a lot of places, and that is that federal land management agencies since, uh, well, since before this time, but beginning formally in 1935, have been sort of dedicated to this policy of putting out all fires anywhere at all time. Okay? That's slowly being relaxed over the years in some parts of the landscape. But in places like California, where a lot of the forest was, was adapted to very frequent fire, you have completely changed the nature of the ecological system and the way it works. When you remove a, a disturbance that's such a profound molder of adaptation and ecological process from a system, and you do it for 80, 90, 100 years, it's a whole different system. Okay, So that's a big deal in a lot of the landscape. It's not just climate. Another one is fire management practices and policies. I referred to one of those, which is fire suppression. But another one is that the way that we fight fire today is entirely different from the way that we fight fire when they founded the Smoke Jumper Institute out here in Missoula. Okay? It used to be that the Forest Service and other land management agencies had uh, essentially a standing order that any ignition on federal lands was going to be put out by 10.30 the next morning. Okay? That was the idea. All right? That was what you were shooting for. Okay? We still have similar policies. They're not nearly as strict or stringent. There are places now where we will let natural ignitions go. And in fact, the policy's even gotten much more liberal than that uh, relatively recently. Um, but the way that we fight fire is really different because in the 1960s and 70s and even into the 80s, we started losing groups of young people in wilderness areas, in places where they shouldn't be fighting fires that didn't need to be fought under situations that begged for them to just let it go. And beginning in the 80s, you start to see a relaxation in the way we fight fire. And so what we do today is more of what we would call indirect attack instead of direct attack. Do you understand the difference? Direct attack is you just go right after the fire, right in front of it, put it out. 
Indirect attack is use topography, use weather, use time. Force a fire to go where you know you can put it out. That takes time and it results in bigger fires, right? So it's really difficult for us to put numbers on how fire management policies have changed the way fires burn. But we have to remember that all of those things play a role across the western US. Can't do that one. Um, so again, future fire trends, just to look at all of the models you see, essentially predict, in this case, uh, this is a paper by Jim Lenahan a couple years ago, uh, project real strong increases in annual burned area for most of the state. And in fact, where they see uh, trends actually reversing or being more or less zero, it's because in the case of the desert that there's nothing left to burn, right? Or in the Klamath Mountains because of an uncertain role of fog on the coast there and the way warmer oceans, et cetera, what, what role they're going to play there. The other thing that can change is you can also go to hardwood types that don't burn quite as fiercely. The state of California is uh, projecting strong increases in the probabilities of large fires, the kind of things that we have trouble controlling. And there are also projections out there that the intensity of fire is likely to go up across a lot of the landscape. Although again, this has a lot to do with the vegetation on the, on the site and so it's a difficult to model this kind of stuff. Okay, so just in terms of a fire summary. Wildfires in California are becoming more frequent and larger. The frequent thing, I just want to remind you, is not necessarily a bad thing, right? We're suppressing so much fire in the landscape that a lot of people feel it's the single biggest negative management impact we have on a lot of the West, and that is reducing fire frequency. Okay, I'm talking ecologically speaking, okay? What's a problem is, is the way that these fires burn when they escape control. As I showed in those graphs, they're getting bigger, they're becoming more severe, resource damage, et cetera, becomes a real issue, soil damage, et cetera. Annual burned areas increasing across most of the vegetation types. I'm not, I, I can't spend any time explaining this here. I, I, well, actually, tell you what, I'll, I'll give it a minute. Um, we're not seeing fire severity increase in all vegetation types. And of course, Northern Rockies Lodgepole Pine is a classic example, spruce fir, et cetera. These are systems that have, have been adapted and are adapted to relatively infrequent fire that when it burns, it tends to be really hot, right? Think Yellowstone fires 1988. Okay? Everyone thought, whoa, this is a disaster. It wasn't a disaster. That's the way that system works, right? A couple hundred years go by. Remember that most of the rainfall typically tends to fall in late spring, early summer. Fuels in lodgepole forest are often too moist to burn. But if you give yourself a couple years of drought, some lightning ignitions, you can burn up Rhode Island in a couple of weeks, no problem. All right? And you can't stop it. It's a lot like Southern California Chaparral. That's the way that system burns. And you just got to wait till the weather changes, all right, to put it out. But a lot of California fire types, the end types in California dominated by ponderosa pine originally, what burned very, very differently. Those were called fuel limited types. Now let me just explain to you what I mean by these. Subalpine forests or lodgepole pine in the Rockies, for example, is what we call climate limited. What that means is that system almost always has enough fuel in the system to burn if it's dry enough to burn it. Does that make sense? You guys live here. You hike around lodgepole pine. I mean, how fun is it to leave a trail in a lodgepole pine forest in the summer? I mean, what a nightmare. It's just jackstrawed stuff down all over the place, right? So the question is, can you get it dry enough so when there's an ignition, it takes off? So that's climate limited, all right? Southern California chaparral is actually ignition limited, all right? The point is there that we didn't have lightning strikes very often in Southern California, and so that when fires get set, they get set by people. All right? Fuels limited are ponderosa pine, Jeffrey pine, stuff like that. So these are systems in which the fuels are very flammable. The system is dry enough in the summer that almost every summer you can burn it. It is in the, in the condition that it could burn if you get an ignition if there's enough fuel. But these systems burn all the time, right? I mean, you look at fire scar records for most yellow pine systems, they were burning seven, eight, nine, ten years, you would get a fire back in those, that place. So it's limited by fuel naturally because the fuel would burn up. And it takes seven, eight, nine, ten years to get sufficient needle cast and stuff into the system such that you can even burn it again. Okay? So, just want to make that distinction because I don't want to suggest to you that I'm, I, I think that this is, there's a fire problem everywhere. A lot of the U.S. there is not a fire problem in terms of the effects of fire suppression. And then basically in the future, we're looking at a lot of inertia towards more fire. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the ecological implications of this. So let's talk about vegetation first. So what I've done here, I'll just go back for a second. 
So this is the Sierra Nevada region right here, this kind of big old nematode looking thing right here. And what uh, I did was I grabbed some data from uh, uh, Jim Linehan's work and they've got, again I told you, like this is the name of, this is like parallel climate model and this is one scenario that we talked about A2 and B1, et cetera. And so what we did is we just basically summed their model outputs for the Sierra Nevada for the period 2071 to 2100. And really all you can do with all these different scenarios is just look at all of them and see if there are any commonalities. As far as I'm concerned, that's about all you can really do with them. If there's a commonalities across all these scenarios and you think, oh, you know, this is something that might actually happen. Well, what you can see here is that for the Sierra Nevada, there are a couple of things that all these models suggest are going to happen. Number one, if you look at the blue stuff, big loss in subalpine vegetation. I think this is a little simplistic, but essentially the idea being that these are essentially systems that grow in areas that have long snowpacks that are deep of long duration, a lot of water availability in the summer, they're very, very cold. These species don't have anywhere to go, right? If you move climates uphill, then they sort of have to disappear off the top of the mountain, all right? Next one is that the, uh, the light green thing here, which is uh, mixed forest, in other words, it has a, in California to us that means it has a strong component of broadleaf species. So there are a lot of oaks in this, maples, things like that. It becomes really strongly dominant on the landscape in a lot of these models. This makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, I won't go into it, but physiologically, if you have warmer nighttime temperatures and sufficient precip, broadleaf species can compete really well with conifers in a place like California. And in fact, if you look at the trend data I'll show you in a minute, this pattern's already happening. The other thing is a big increase in grassland. What do you think's driving that? You guys know anything about grasslands in general? Like where do they grow? What's that? Uh, well, tell me about, so um, I'm trying to think how I can cue an answer here. Uh, you know how grass works, right? You mow grass and it does fine, right, in your lawn. Grass is basically the best disturbance adapted vascular plant going, okay? In most places that grass is dominant today, probably woody species could dominate that site if you either unflooded the soil or didn't burn it all the time or you just added a little soil to the site. I mean, grass does really well in disturbed sites, okay? And what's going on here is, is that this model that Jim and Ron Nielsen and other people built suggests that a lot of the woody vegetation on these landscapes is just going to burn up because their model includes a lot of fire in the system. And this is exactly what we see in Southern California already happening. Again, I don't know how well you know Southern California, but if you do, if you know the area around Pasadena or San Bernardino or Corona or Burbank or any of those places, there used to be real dense stands of coastal sage scrub and chaparral right down into the valleys. And what you have now is about 1,000 to 1,500 feet of just dirt and invasive weeds that stretch from the valley up into where the shrubs can still hang on because it burns so often. I mean, there are places in the Angeles National Forest that have burned almost 20 times in the last 70 or 80 years. All right? And there are way more ignitions, but they get them out. Right? I'm talking fires that escaped. You can't support woody vegetation in a place that burns that often. It's not possible. So what dominates is grasses. This is for the Sierra Nevada foothills. You know, similar stuff. Maybe a little more grass. So this one's not quite as, uh, quite, quite as clear. So what I wanted to show is what's interesting, um, maybe gratifying for the model builders, but scary for me as a person involved in ecosystem management, is that exactly these kind of trends and the projections are already underway and have been for 75 years or so. So this is based on a mapping product that the Forest Service generated for a lot of the California forests in the 1930s. There's a huge data set of plots associated with these as well. And Solomon's had some really interesting papers published using this plot data set. And what it shows is real strong changes in the cover of vegetation in the Sierra Nevada. There's Lake Tahoe just for reference, okay? In the cover of the Sierra Nevada over the last 75 years. And the main one, so let me explain these codes to you. This is Ponderosa Pine, okay? I don't know what color that is. Light green, let's call it. If you look at this map here, you see how much of that light green there is in there? It's almost all gone here, okay? There are two reasons for that, or two or three. There's probably a climate signal, tough to say actually, but the main thing is human management. First of all, ponderosa pine is an extremely valuable wood. We logged all the big trees, almost all of them, way back, 
Okay? The second thing is, is that that species, like most pine species, is disturbance adapted and requires disturbance to remain a dominant in the forest stand. So if you remove fire from the system, shade tolerant and fire intolerant species like true firs, incense cedar, and other things take the stand over. That's mainly what's going on here, is these stands are filling in with fire intolerant species. Okay, that's the classic fire suppression thing. Okay? You also see it with Jeffrey pine and east side pine on the east side of the Sierra Nevada. A lot of blue, much less blue now. It's filling in with shade tol uh, tolerant species. And then the other thing you see that is what the models predict is these are hardwood types, okay? Things that have a lot of oaks in them in particular. And if you look at the map here and compare the amount of that light purple to the amount here, you can see there's actually more of it on the landscape. So again, probably carried out largely through disturbance like logging and fire because these species re-sprout and the oaks take over those sites relatively quickly. This isn't necessarily a negative thing. I'm not suggesting that. It's just something that we're seeing. Okay? Okay, I just wanted to look at a couple of the sort of the interactions that we see. Again, I don't know how, what you know about California geography or anything. This is uh, above San Diego on Laguna Mountain just to the west. San Diego County, by the way, is the most biodiverse county in the entire the United States. Um, and uh, this is a stand of Jeffrey Pine that was killed by the Cedar Fire. And this photo was six years post-fire, and there's absolutely no regeneration of Jeffrey Pine at all in the stand. So I don't remember in the end whether they made a decision to plant it or not. We actually recommended that they not replant it with Jeffrey Pine because this is right at the lowest limit of where Jeffrey Pine grows as an adult. And we're just looking at the climate change projections and thinking, this is probably a waste of money. You know, I don't know how these seedlings survive. Probably wouldn't be a bad idea to plant some just to track it and see what happens. Um, but what's coming up are shrubs and hardwoods, no problem. All right? This is by Topaz Lake, which is in, in, on a Nevada, uh, uh, California border, just south of Lake Tahoe. And this is a classic intermountain or Great Basin picture. All right? So what this is, this whole area used to be covered with pinyon pine and some scattered western juniper, all right? Sierra juniper as well, all right? So you see all the snags in here? Okay, so this burned up. There's a highway right here. Someone threw a cigarette or something out, okay? Woo, 10,000 acres went off in a couple of days. And this is all cheat grass and brome, and there ain't never gonna be any conifers on that site ever again. I doubt it, it'll ever happen. You know what cheat grass is? Bromus tectorum, it's this, it's a, it's, a, it's a Mediterranean, Central Asian grass species. It's an annual, all right? And it, it, it grows earlier than almost any of the native plants in California. It already has green and has heads out before anyone's even starting to bolt. And by the time your native plants are starting to emerge out of the soil, it's already turned brown. And I'm telling you, you can like spit at it and it starts on fire. It's absolutely amazing. It it's burns like gasoline. It's, it's really quite incredible. And its seeds survive for a long time in the seed bank. So man, what an adaptation. It's an annual plant, right? So the mother plant's already dead. And when that stuff burns, it kills everything around it. Sets a perfect seed bed for more cheat grass. And after a while, that's all you got. And the problem with these systems is, is that pinyon pine is not a species that recovers after fire very well at all. It just simply doesn't. So the whole Intermountain West is in basically an emergency situation in uh, New Mexico and Utah and parts of Arizona and Nevada where, you know, they start these fires on windy days and they'll burn 100,000 acres, no problem. And then you're looking at ecosystem changing events, completely changing the cover of the landscape and, and, and the way that it works. This is going on some places, forest land converting to shrubland because of frequent burns. That's not always a negative uh, outcome necessarily. One of the things that, you know, I, I work for an agency that's pretty dominated by foresters, always has been. I don't know if, well, whether it always will be. It's a little bit less dominated by foresters than it used to be. And as, so when you would lose a forest stand, we'd think, oh, that's a bad thing. Well. You gotta think of the wildlife, for example. You think about where all the acorns and all the berries and all the hiding cover and all that stuff is, it's in that kind of habitat. It's not in dense conifer stands. So this kind of habitat is a really, really important ecological role to play. The question is how much of it is really necessary on the landscape. And this is a picture of what I was telling you about in Southern California. These are all non-native species. Absolutely everything sitting here is a non-native. Actually, that might be an Ansinchia, but this used to be all very dense coastal sage scrub. This is along the road above San Bernardino up into the mountains, and it's just, there's a fire there every year, at least, you know. Okay, this is kind of cool, or at least to me it's kind of cool. 
Um, and that is that these are, these are the plants codes, but this species is Calicedrus decurrence. And what we're finding is that this is not a, this is incense cedar. You wouldn't know it, it's not out here, okay? But it's a relatively uncommon species in, in the California mountains. I mean, it's not like you don't see it, but it's never dominant anywhere, all right? But in Southern California, in the beginning of the 2000s, we had a really severe drought. They had a couple of their driest years of all time, and then a couple of other real dry years after that. We had this massive influx of pine beetles that killed millions of trees. A lot of trees died directly of drought. So we've got changing forest types. You have huge inputs of ozone into this system. Really strong air pollution stress on a lot of these forests. You've got rising temperatures, increasing drought, there's fires burning all over the place. So we said, all right, let's take the dominant tree species in these systems and let's just go through the literature and see who tends to survive best in all, through all these things. The interesting thing is Pippo is ponderosa pine, that's Jeffrey pine, that's white fir, that's sugar pine. This species wins out in almost every one of these contests. It's not a very common tree in California right now, but if you look at the paleo record, you know what I mean? So in other words, um, pollen cores, for example, right? In, in soils or in lakes, it's really common along with oaks anytime the climate gets really dry. Oh. Also, if you go into these mountains and look at what they've cut down that died and now look at the, the resulting surviving forest, it's almost all incense cedar. We're watching biogeography happen. It's amazing. You know, this has really big implications for the wildlife, though, because birds hate this thing. <laughs> you guys know that redwoods are like almost the most apocryphal trees for birds. Did you know that? Strong tannins in trees drive off a lot of guilds of birds. I generalize. There are some birds that do fine in there, but redwoods, you just don't see a whole lot of birds. Well, incense cedar is really, really similar. So if forests are dominated by incense cedar, it's not just an issue from the plant side, but it's going to have major outcomes with birds. Uh, it also is now a valuable timber tree, whereas 10 years ago they would have been really scared, but now they use it for pencils and stakes and you name it. Okay, not only is fire becoming more severe in general, but the patch sizes that are burning at high severity are becoming larger. So what's happening is that within fires, these sort of areas in which all the trees get nuked and it's a bunch of standing snags are becoming bigger, right? Well, that's an issue for a lot of reasons. It increases forest fragmentation. It has major implications for post-fire regeneration, right? Conifer seeds kind of have a, a, a distance that wind can blow them or a critter can move them. And the bigger you make that patch, probabilistically, the more difficult it is for those species to be able to recolonize. Again, I, I don't want to suggest this is necessarily a bad or a good thing. You just got to understand this, all right? And then you've got soil erosion issues. The bigger the patch of no, soil, of no ground cover that you've got on a, uh, in a system, big post-fire rain event, you can get some pretty severe erosive outcomes. I also just want to finish up this section by reminding people that lack of fire is just as serious an ecosystem disturbance as uncharacteristically severe fire. We're still putting out fire across most of the western US. It's a big ecological issue. It's leading to ecosystem changing events like lots of shade tolerant species coming up around what used to be very large and open grown pine species. This thing burns, they all die, including the big guy. All right? Fire also keeps meadows open. This is, you know, you guys know Yosemite Park, Tuolumne Meadows, you know you drive through that on the Tioga Road. I don't think most people know that it is fastidiously gardened by the Park Service. They don't want you to know that. This is a system that because of dropping water levels in groundwater tables, that it's drying out and lodgepole pine is filling the meadow. So they stop for two, because they have these debates in the Park Service, right? What should we do? Should we do the natural thing or should we make it look pretty? Let's do natural for a few years. It's like letting your beard grow for a few years, right? And your girlfriend says, no freaking way, cut that off. You know, and that's what's going on here is after two years, the park supervisor said, ah, oh, this ain't working, man. So they snuck out one morning and cut them all down again, and it's all pretty and all open now, again. <laughs> so, at any rate, fire is going to interact with climate and other factors. It will provoke major vegetation change. It's already happening. As high severity area and patch size increase in some forest systems and as summer droughts deepen, you're going to see difficulty for some conifer species with respect to their regenerative capacity on landscapes. I mean, that's biogeography in action. That's the way it happens, right? Things change. Species have to, have to figure out what to do. Hardwood species are going to become more common in California in, in middle elevations. Again, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Going to see more shrubland. Going to see a lot more grassland on a lot of the landscape. Um, and then subalpine, who knows? 
Okay, I'm, I have to go through this pretty quickly because I need to finish up here in five or ten minutes. Um, but I just want just to note this, that uh, disturbance and its interaction with climate has impacts on ecological patterns and processes. It has really strong impacts on evolutionary patterns and processes as well. Right? One sort of grades into the other as you make your way through time. So this is a model that Julie Denslow developed. And oh, it's just real simple. It just says, OK, let's say you got a system that has a certain characteristic disturbance of frequency. I mean, it could be an intertidal system. It could be a stream system. It could be a fire system. You know, it could be a grazed meadow, whatever, right? Let's say that that frequency for a real long time is sort of centered somewhere in here, right, where that arrow is. And let's say that in the current management scenario, that the frequency that that is actually happening, or the time since the last disturbance, is also kind of in the middle. So it sort of matches it. Well, her model predicts then that that system will maximize plant, in this case, plant diversity, but species diversity, if you're matching the long-term characteristic disturbance frequency with the current disturbance frequency. Does that make any sense? It's really simplistic, but that's the general idea. So if this is the characteristic disturbance frequency up here somewhere, but in the system, you have now way too much disturbance. You strongly drive diversity downward. If you have way too little disturbance, you strongly drive disturbance downward. That's just the way evolution works, all right? And sometimes natural system change, and the graph changes. But you've got to understand that, right? That's sort of the evolutionary side of this. So we've got these systems in California like yellow pine and mixed conifer that were really, really frequent fire systems, right? Less than 20 year fire return intervals, less than 10 in many cases. We've got white fir, red fir systems maybe in the 30s. This is about how many years since fire suppression has really been effective in California. Any forest system falling below that line is going to have had pretty serious impacts of fire suppression, right? If you're in a system that over 100 years ought to have had 15 fires and it's had none, You've made a major change to that system. If you're in a system that only has a fire about every two to 400 years, and you've only been actively trying to stop fire for 65 years, you haven't had an impact on that system, at least not in that respect. Okay? So what you'd expect then is that human actions will have had major effects on the way fire burns in these systems, but not in these. And that's exactly what we find. So this is the proportion of fires burning over the last 25 years that are at what we call high severity. All right? And these are our best guesses from a whole lot of different data sources. It was probably a pre-Euro-American settlement regime. All right? Look at these guys below that line. Sorry, I should have the line there. Maybe I do have it there. No, I don't. Okay? But these systems that are far below that line have had major changes and are burning way hotter than we think they did historically. Systems above there, there's really no difference. So in yellow pine systems, this is the way they probably look. This is a restored Stan Lake Tahoe Basin. This is about 400 meters away. This forest looked exactly like that before it was treated. So they did a commercial thin. Three years later, they did a pre-commercial thin. Then they piled the fuels. And then a couple years later, they did a prescribed burn. All right? So these two systems burn in the same fire. That one looks like that when it's done. And that one looks like that when it's done. All right? So, what's the, what's the meaning of that for biodiversity? Well, the interesting thing is, it's exactly what you'd predict if you know anything about the way evolution works. All right? That is, if the system is a system that for a long, long time has had relatively frequent, moderate, moderately severe fires, and then you burn the crap out of it, you'd expect that there really wouldn't be a lot of species in the system adapted to that niche. Right? And that's exactly what we're finding. That in, and we've, we, this is one from one fire, but we now have data out of 11 that we're tracking all this stuff in kind of long term. And that is that there's higher biodiversity in the treated thin stands than there is in the untreated. That is the opposite of what you find in lodgepole pine or in chaparral. In those systems, you get higher diversity post-fire in dense chaparral than you do in open chaparral. All right? You guys know anything about chaparral? I mean, the, fa the thing that's famous about chaparral is it's insanely diverse, but only after you burn it, right? If you wait 20, 30, 40, 50 years after a fire, it's this 10-foot high stand of stuff. You can't even get through it. But as soon as it burns, there are all these species that live as seeds in the sand, right? And when it burns hot, boom, it goes nuts, and you got 50 species, or 35, or 40 in a small area, OK? Again, totally predictable. That system has always burned that way. Hence, you would expect a lot of niches in that system for species that regenerate after a very severe fire. All right. So basically, 
Ecological theory just simply predicts that diversity ought to be highest under some characteristic regime. Again, when you change the regime, that's called biogeography. Things change. It doesn't take humans, you know, climates change, continents move, you know, sun waxes and wanes, grasses grow, they don't grow, you know. So species have to adapt to whatever the disturbance regime is. They don't have a choice. They're either in the system or they're not, all right? And that's the way they're going to respond. Um, what I'm noting here, this stuff's available to people, right? Because I don't want to spend time on this too much. But I just want to note that this is probably the single, in my mind, the single biggest management issue in these frequent fire systems in, in California, particularly in the Sierra Nevada, is that we put everything out. And it's cascading into all of these other effects. It's cascading into highly severe fires that we can't put out, that are burning up homes and killing people, that are costing billions of dollars to put out over the course of a year across a lot of the western US, that have carbon outcomes, you know, in terms of lost carbon on site. They have soil erosive outcomes. If, if you get rainfall, they have sedimentation outcomes into reservoirs, which have got to feed humans. You know, it, it just goes on and on and on and on. But I just want to note that in Southern California, it's a completely different scene. And it's exactly the opposite. And the issue down there is it's a completely different ecosystem. And the problem there is that because of human ignition, it's burning way too often. And all that we can do there is try to stop fire as, as well as we can. And it's not an easy thing to do. OK, this is the last thing I want to talk about. So this is a huge issue for us. Because in the Forest Service, even though we primarily manage, really we manage woody things, right? Really, that's really most of what we do. We grow or we cut trees, right? And almost everything, at least historically, that's what we've done. Now, what I mean is, is that was the core of the agency's mission, all right? Still, a lot of what we do on the landscape involves something to do with that. It's either pushing succession or slowing succession down. And a lot of that happens to be you know, done with something having to do with trees. Well, it has outcomes. It has outcomes for wildlife. It has outcomes for water. It has outcomes for plant species. And so we have a lot of other specialists who work in the agency who have sort of changed the mission now. And we're like you know, ecosystem managers and everything. But this whole management thing has major implications for wildlife species. And as a federal agency, when we end up in court, it's almost always because of these guys, right? For good reason. Okay, So I just wanted to talk about two groups, old forest obligates, spotted owl, fisher, post-fire specialists. In this case, it's a blackback woodpecker, but there's a lot of different kinds of woodpeckers. Okay, So I just have a paper in press right now with Josh Lawler where we did a bunch of GCM climate niche models for all of the species in the genus Martis. You know what that is? Those are the weasels and the minks and the sables and fishers and stuff like that. Okay, And um, then we did some other stuff. But basically, we were interested in just, you know, this is really broad stuff. I mean, so how useful this is, I can't say, because a lot of these species are actually dependent on microtopographic stuff that we can't even model, all right? But the, the sad thing for California is to note that almost all the models that we ran suggested either complete or s significant contraction in the macroclimatic you know, variables that seem to drive its habitat for California. All right? And we found that for a lot of these species. Um, but that model, even though on its own it's kind of alarming, it doesn't take fire into account at all. And if you know anything about ecology or biogeography, you know that natural ecosystems change most quickly due to disturbance. Rising temperature on its own isn't going to do a whole lot. Right? You, know, you ever heard of like giant sequoias, or bristlecone pine, or redwoods, or some of the really big dug firs you may have had or still have in, in, in Montana? Man, they're a half century, a century, two, three centuries old in some cases. They can survive almost anything you throw at them unless you kill them with a disease or burn them up or something. All right? What's key is when they germinate, right? When those things germinate, those first couple of decades is when they get those roots and they hold on. All right? It's going to take disturbance to make most of the changes that most of these models predict. Climate itself is not going to do it in most cases, all right? until maybe it gets really extreme. So when you look at fire projections, all the projections for both fisher populations are for more frequent fire and more intense fire. That really worries me. Um, I, I'm not, I have all these other scenarios we did. I'm not going to show them to you. So, and these projected increases in severity, they're all, already well underway. Here's the belt of probable best guesses at the way fires worked in these, a lot of these systems before we started suppressing fire. Here's where it's burning now. 5 to 10 percent mortality. That's not true. 5 to 10 percent area of what we call high severity fire versus you know, 25 to 30 now in the fires that we typically have in the landscape. So the last thing I want to note is with respect to the post-fire obligates. Really important species. 
Species particularly important in like the northern Rockies or places that have got, you know, the kind of systems that don't burn very often, but when they do, they create an insane amount of habitat. And there are a lot of critters, woodpeckers, a lot of flycatchers, a whole bunch of other animals that are strongly adapted to using that kind of habitat, and it's an important part of their life cycle. And they migrate from fire to fire. They spend four, five, six, seven years, and then they move on. All right? Well, in California, there's not a whole lot of that kind of habitat. There is some. There are some of those kinds of forests, but there's way less than there is in the Rockies or say in Oregon or Washington or BC. And so what we did was we have a pretty good idea of about how much snag habitat it was created by fires on average across the Sierra Nevada before Euro Americans showed up. And all I want to show you is that even though we suppress most fires, the ones that we get are burning so hot that we're easily filling the bag of that kind of habitat in the state. And the reason I show this is because we've got a bunch of people we deal with in court constantly who are trying to move northern Montana to California. Like this is a major issue. If you look at all the projections I showed you with future fire frequency and area and severity, my point here is simply that for wildlife, we've got to worry about the old forest obligate species. Most of these post-fire specialists are going to be fine. And uh, I'm not trying to give short shrift to any species, but when it comes down to an agency that has to focus money and effort and time, as long as you're not salvage logging all of this stuff, believe me, there's going to be a lot of it on the landscape in the next 50 to 100 years. These critters like owls and fisher and other species that are reliant on dense, moist, high canopy conditions in a place like California are going to have a heck of a time making it if you're looking at the kind of fire inertia and 50 million people and ignitions and continued dry summers you know, that we have. So at any rate, um, just some concluding thoughts. So, our priorities in the Forest Service right now, um, as they're stated at any rate, um, are ecological restoration, ecosystem services, climate change adaptation mitigation. You know, it's not timber production. It's not, you know, stuff like that. Um, so at least that's what the agency is focused on. That's what it says it's focused on. We have this management focus on restoration, but the problem is it requires some real critical thinking. So one of the big issues then is we used to base management, we still do to an extent on past conditions, right? We want to return to those. That, by the way, is sort of a weight that we bear as Americans because we live on a continent that's only had human habitation for the last 10 to 15,000 years, all right? If you work in Africa, or if you work in Australia, or if you work in Asia, humans have essentially always been there, right? Humans evolved in Africa. So when Africans talk about restoration, they're not thinking about removing humans from the system somehow. You know, that's not part of the equation. They've always been there. They're a necessary and, you know, uh, and, and, and co-adapted part of that system. All right? So we have that problem in the US. We can't get our heads around, oh, humans are part of the system. How do we deal with it? I don't know. I'm glad we have wilderness areas, but there's a lot of other landscape that requires much more critical thinking about how we actually make this happen. Um, so for fire management, um, you know, and, and, and these ecological disturbances and warming, we got major threshold conditions in a lot of the West. Um, and I just want to state that you are going to have to get used to the fact that there are going to be really major changes in landscapes, probably during the lifetime of you younger students in here. We may see these well, you know, before we pass away as well. This scares me. And the sad thing about climate change, of course, is it's insidious, it's slow. And even if we stop now, it's not going to matter, right? I mean, the residence time of a CO2 molecule in the atmosphere is insanely long. So unlike the ozone hole, which we just said, oh, okay, CFCs just have to stop those? Okay, done. Two years later, ozone hole starting to close up and we have a new propellant, right? Well, we're not going to find tomorrow, currently, particularly with the current political atmosphere, we're not going to find uh, a solution to our energy dependence on fossil fuels anytime soon. And even if we do, because of this residence time issue, I mean, we're looking at, at any rate, just want to warn you, <laughs> it's going to be weird. Um, so, and I'm kind of glad I'm not going to be around, actually. Um, so at any rate, and I'm really, what I'm worried about, again, is these old forest obligate species. We've got real problems with, I don't, and I don't know, I don't think we should be focusing on species, actually. We should be focusing on ecosystem process, pattern, making sure that these biological arenas exist for adaptation and evolution to continue. I mean, uh, Stephen Jay Gould had, I don't know if you remember him, he was a very, very famous evolutionist, right? 
He used to drive environmentalists crazy because he was sort of a natural ally of theirs because of all the things he said, all the natural history writing he did. But he would laugh when people would like worry about the world. He just said, the world will survive, man. We've been through the Permian extinctions and the Cretaceous extinctions and humans, you know, we're going to drive ourselves extinct, I guarantee it. Don't know when it's going to happen. But the world will just evolve some wacky looking things with arms coming out of their heads or whatever. And people will have them in museums in another 100,000 years and it'll be fine, you know? <laughs> I don't exactly subscribe to that idea because the world is what we make of it and we care about the world because of what it means to us, right? So um, I just, big part of this is the fire suppression thing. We have a huge issue in the agencies and that is that we still treat fire management as if it's not part of the land and resource management. We're, the good thing is we're at least talking about it as if it were. It is still not there. We fight fires out of one pocket and we manage land out of another pocket. All right? I'm not saying it's anyone's fault. I understand it. It's a short-term issue versus a long-term issue. We have to get over it and it has to happen fast. It's going to require unprecedented integration of science and management and we really need help of smart people like you guys. I just want to end with a depressing slide that shows the Forest Service's spending on research and development since 2000. <laughs> and spending on fire suppression as a percent of the discretionary budget in the same time. Now, this is a huge underestimate in terms of the actual amount spent on fire because it's actually about 50% of the budget at the end of the year after we've paid for all the fires and everything. So it's like the defense budget in, 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 our, in, our, in, our, in our national budget, right? It's a giant piece of the pie and we pretend like it doesn't exist, like it shouldn't be changed. This worries me because any corporation knows that if you're spending less than 10% of your budget on R&D, you've got big problems and we're trending downward. Thanks. So I have to take questions for you. There never are any questions in my talks. No, I'm kidding. Because I cover everything. <laughs> Well, make something up, don't you? Don't they get a better grade if they ask a question? Definitely. Okay. They'll write pass fail, so get a capital P with a bold P or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Ask me about the Yankees or Bayern Munich. I don't care. Viable. Yeah, please. So, how does the decline in timber harvest interact with this also? No. I mean, we've got fire suppression that's going on, and now a much reduced timber harvest level. Well, so I, I'm going to be careful and probably restrict my comments to uh, California systems a little bit. No, I, I won't do that. Let me just say this. There, it, it affects everything in a lot of ways, right? So uh, Steve and I both work for the Forest Service, okay? We both work in sort of resources. I'm an ecologist. Steve's a botanist. The reason that we get to exist in the agency to, a, to an extent, I don't, need, I don't want to say this the wrong way, is that there are receipts or budgets attached to activities that we do, right? And some of that money is sent to fund resource staff. Well, it used to be that timber dollars funded resource staff, right? So if you look at Pacific Northwest region, they still have a legacy of that. They have an insane number of resource staff in the Pacific, Oregon, Washington, sorry. Even though timber is not nearly as profitable as it was, and as those jobs become free from retirements, they may not and cannot fill them. They don't have the money. So I know that's not what you're getting at, but one of the things to think about is if you work in fire or have something to do with fire, you're doing okay these days. Right? So uh, luckily I'm a fire ecologist to an extent and I do relatively well. If you don't work in something to do with fire right now, you got problems, you know? Um, so the ecological issues though are more important. And the timber harvest thing is, okay, so do you guys remember Healthy Forest Restoration Act or Healthy Forest Initiative? Remember that whole thing? I don't know if you guys were around. Right when George, George Bush Jr. became president, pretty quickly after that, an act passed Congress that this is the Sesame Street version of this. It's a lot more complicated than this, but it, it allowed for contractors to the Forest Service to take a smattering of large trees, all right, out of contracted fuels thinning sales to help pay for them. You understand the difference between a timber sale and a fuels thinning? Timber sale is you're cutting trees to build homes or something. A fuel thinning is where you're actually going out and removing timber from a stand, almost all small trees down to brush, et cetera, to reduce fire hazard in the stand, okay? So 
because of lawsuits, et cetera, the timber program in the, in the Forest Service is, has, is a fraction of what it was across the whole country, right? in terms of the, that lumber producing thing. Okay? Outcome of that is, of course, there are no sawmills anymore, anywhere, right? So the problem is that with no sawmills, so okay, so, so let's say we've just, we don't even cut timber for like wood anymore. Let's pretend we don't even do that. We, so we almost don't, okay? So now what we would like to do to deal with this fire suppression problem is do thinning on a lot of western forests, right? Because we feel as we, we can do it more safely using mechanical means. Does that make sense? Because setting fires in people's backyards freaks them out. Right? I mean, a lot of people say, hey man, just let it burn, or just do prescribed fire everywhere. Ooh, you know, 80 years of fire suppression, uh, maybe we ought to get some of the fuel out of there first, you know, and then let's light it off, okay? And I subscribe to that. I think it makes a lot of sense for a lot of the landscape. Problem is now, the product that, okay, so again, economics, we're in the US, right? We're not in Scandinavia or in Soviet Union or something where the government can say, do this, move money, and it happens. If you don't have an economic market, it shall not happen in this country. It does not happen, okay? Forest Service doesn't do its own cutting. It's done by private companies or corporations that, right, that win a bidding process to go and do the work, okay? Are they gonna do the work if they can't make a profit? No way. Absolutely not, okay? So that was why the Healthy Forest Restoration Act came along. They said, okay, all right, well these guys, they can't make a profit unless they can get wood to build homes, right, or whatever, so they need big trees to be able to do it, so let's let them do it. Well, ecologically, it's not a good idea. You're actually removing the exact trees that you want to protect by the fuel thinning, okay? It's a little hypocritical. So that hasn't really worked out very well. So you've got the situation now where there are fewer sawmills out there because there's no timber market anymore, all right? And when you want to do a fuels project, if a company can't make any money off of it, you're never going to actually cut anything, all right, unless you pay them to take the stuff off site. And not too many forests have that kind of money, although some do, right, for a while because of a congressional earmark. Oh, earmarks. There are no more earmarks, right? Obama's got, like, they're done, right? So that kind of stuff ain't going to happen anymore. So what do you do with this material, all right? So what it means, wow, isn't this a crazy story? I forgot how deep this was. You shouldn't ask this question because um, it's going to keep going for a while. Um, but so the next part of it is, since you have to deal with it economically, is where do you send the stuff? Okay, well, in California, pff, there are barely any sawmills anymore. There are just a few left, and they're barely holding on. And the only ones that are making it are the ones that have retooled to take smaller materials now. Okay? All right. So if, okay, so then, now we've got all this stuff. We've got these small trees that we want to cut. It's small trees and a lot of garbage, actually. Right? It's small trees and really small trees, and it's shrubs, and it's all this crap. Okay, so if you're an entrepreneur, what would you use that material for? What could you use that material for? Paper. Oh, okay, all right, cool. Paper, for example, what else? Oh, I heard energy somewhere. So the biomass market, I don't know if you like read about what's going on in Scandinavia, but there are cities of 100,000 people in Sweden and Finland which are completely energy independent. They burn biomass, all right? It's people's compost and their newspapers, but it is also a steady stream of material out of neighboring forests. You may not like the way they manage their forests. They're a little bit different from some of ours, but the fact is, is they have a social contract, they have an economic base, and they just send this stuff to the thing and it heats the whole darn town and everyone's happy. They create almost no emissions because the, the way they burn this stuff, there's almost nothing comes out of it. They have no connection to the Middle East. There's no oil flowing into this place. Energy security, you ever heard of that? Do they have to have a huge army and navy like to secure the Persian Gulf so they can get oil? <laughs> this stuff is like this, people. You know what I'm saying? And so biomass to somebody in the Forest Service, you think about all the problems you could solve if you could develop a viable biomass market and, you know, do this work sensitively, ecologically speaking, which is a really big issue. All right, let's be honest. You could solve so many problems. So it's kind of a nirvana right now. So what's going on? Well. If you're a entrepreneur and you want to uh, take advantage of all of this small timber and stuff that's on the forest, and you want to do it this way, right, for energy, okay, then you have to invest money in some kind of plant that can burn it. Maybe it's a cogen plant, maybe it's not, maybe it's pure biomass, okay, something like that. Okay, so if you're that entrepreneur, what's the first thing you need to be able to build that place? You need a loan, okay, where's the loan going to come from? Who gives out loans for millions of bucks? Government. Somehow the government's going to be involved. It's going to be through a bank, but the government's going to be there to help guarantee some loan, right? That's called subsidization, right? State of Iowa, subsidized corn, heard of that? 
by the way, which is a total ripoff. I hope you're not from Iowa, but we're losing money on that one because the payoff is, doesn't, it doesn't pay off. It does not. In terms of the carbon balance, it doesn't pay off. Okay? Important people in Iowa, though, because they're the people who pick our president. So the, the, even though there's only about 15 of them, it's the amazing thing. So, um, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the biomass thing is you've got to have money, so you need subsidy. Okay? And then let's say you get it going and it's running. What's the next thing you need to keep that business going? You need biomass, you need product, and it has to come in a constant, predictable stream, right? Okay, so no way, because the Forest Service gets sued on every fuel setting project it tries to do, well, at least in California, I don't know about here, but that's about all I ever do anymore as I give depositions in court about this treatment or that one. So we don't have society on our side yet on this, and this is a huge issue. Um, I'm heavily involved as a scientist trying to inform some of this work. Um, there are a couple of national level environmental organizations who are laying down on the railroad tracks to stop federal subsidy of a biomass market in the United States. Because, I want to say this the right way, and they have the right to have this feeling, Ideolo ideologically they're opposed to yellow hard hats and chainsaws in the forest. It's that simple. That's basically what it comes down to. All right, that's fine. We need to have an, 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 you know, an argument and, and figure out how to get around this stuff. But that's what it's come down to. Because the farm bill could easily include subsidy for these things every year, but they've been able to keep it out of the farm bill. Congress has changed. It may be different now. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of different stuff in Washington right now, if you haven't paid any attention. But, uh, you know, so that's, I'm sorry, that was the, that's the Charlotte's Web of that question that you just brought up. You know, I'm totally stuck in that web myself right now. But it, it seems like, that could be a salubrious outcome to develop a, a market that could provide a product to a biomass stream that could provide us with some energy independence, carry out some ecologically important work, prepare for us for reintroduction of fire, and all of those kinds of things. It's pretty cool. I mean, I guess there's really no such thing as a win-win. I'm sure we're not thinking of something. But um, that's you know, where I certainly see it, and I hope we can... I hope we can get there. I had a meeting today with some people at the Fire Science Lab, and they were telling me about these portable uh, biomass burners that people are starting to develop, like on railroad cars and stuff like that. That is cool. I mean, that may end up having to be the solution or in trucks, because then you can go find the product. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be brought to you. So, whew. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, please. Um, so UM is actually uh, developing a biomass plant project. Ooh. And I'm just curious, how would you say, you mentioned it, it could reinforce good ecological practices. How would you make sure it would do that? What policy or? Yeah, so, okay, so here's what I would say. I would say that any market you know, I don't know if you guys, I'm sure you've all had some economics. You know how markets work, right? They sort of start off tentatively and then maybe something catches hold and then whoa, they go like this. Then they hit some limiting factor, right? What I could see happening with biomass would be something like this. Because it's such a great idea. In some forests, you will run out of the product at some point. I don't know when that happens. You know what I mean? So you know how it is? There's like this cost-benefit, supply-demand thing. I, biomass can never supply 100% of American energy needs. It would probably supply 10%, maybe, 15 maybe, something like that. This is the numbers I've heard. That would be astounding if you could get there. But localities like Missoula or the Missoula campus, I don't see why you couldn't uh, you know, continuously feed uh, you know, that kind of size outfit easily from Forest Service projects you know, that rotate. Because again, you have different forest types around here a little bit. But in those systems that had relatively frequent fire, you'd want to be revisiting them every 10 to 20 years. You know? So you'd have to have the rotation set up that there was fire, there was you know, treatments going on, and then at some point you would reach a, an ecosystem capacity in terms of its ability to feed that, and then that would be it for the market. You know? um, but I think no problem. I, don't some of the high schools in town run on biomass? I think some of the high schools here are heated from biomass burning. I know in California there are a number of them. And they're the right size. They could easily be fed through municipal waste or through just a thinning that's going on right around the high school. And that's, I think, where it has to start, right? You've got to show local examples of success. Um, and then no one's losing, right? The investment pays off. You're doing some good work. People see it happen, and then it gets bigger. I don't know if I answered your question at all, but... Yes, please. Um, so in Montana, of course, you know, Park Hill is a huge epidemic. Do you see that something that's moving into California? Is that seen? Is that something that might happen with changing climate? 
That's a great question. It's funny. I was, I was uh, just interviewed on NPR. I don't know if you heard me. I just did a thing on Friday on exactly that. So I know the answer, <laughs> which is I have no idea. Um, the, uh, you have to be careful on radio, you know. Um, but the, uh, the, the answer to that is that, remember, we're a pretty different system, right? We're, we're used to, our forests are very used to a strong drought in the summer, the species, the genotypes and everything. But um, we had a massive uh, mortality event in Southern California in the beginning of the 2000s. It was tied to drought. Um, it killed a lot of different kinds of trees. Beetles killed the pines. Tr st uh, straight drought killed a lot of the firs and some of the other species. We saw it there. That was also tied to ozone uh, stress, you know. So in the uh, Inyo National Forest, you don't know what that is. You know Mount Whitney? That's on the Inyo National Forest, okay. They, in that forest in the last two years, there's been real large areas of bark beetle mortality in white bark pine, which you guys know, and in lodgepole pine, which you also know. And also in the Warner Mountains, which are up in the northeastern corner, kind of with Oregon and Nevada, there's been a lot of outbreaks. So we expect if we get a drought year or two, right now we're not really drought, it's been kind of normally wet this year, that I would expect that to happen. And where I would predict it to happen would be the southern Sierra Nevada. And the reason I would predict that is because Fresno and Bakersfield and all those really big cities down there, you know, each of which is the size of the whole population of Montana, basically, right, generate insane amounts of ozone and pollution. And they are severely stressing forests up to about seven or 8,000 feet in the Sierra Nevada, just like the Southern California forests are stressed. So they have an added, you know, element of like barely hanging on. And so I think a drought, I think you could see a lot of beetle mortality. That would be my prediction. My real prediction is I have no idea. My second one is I have all sorts of ideas. <laughs> Wait, one last question. When does this end? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. um, forests like the Jeffrey Pine Forest you highlighted, you kind of indicated that you think it's better if we plant species that we think are more likely to survive. Um, how widely do you think we should do that? Yeah, so like assisted migration, is that kind of your question? Yeah, um, that's a really sticky one. Um, I think, I actually I'm doing a project right now with some people from a bunch of different universities where we're using the pine genus. Okay, again, I, know if, I don't know if you know anything about pines, right? I think there are about 100 species worldwide of pines, okay? Pine genus is essentially a Pretty stress tolerant and disturbance adapted genus just in general, okay? It tends to require something going on in the site to keep the really competitive species from knocking it out, okay? But the thing about pines is it's crazy valuable wood, all right? As a result of that, we know more about pines as a genus, I'll bet, than anything else on the planet besides maybe Drosophila flies or something like that, you know? <laughs> Probably know more about it than we know about ourselves, you know? I mean, we got the genotypes and all these things. We know how fast they grow. We know how the water stress works. We know how invasive they are. I mean, we know everything, all right? So what we're doing is doing exactly what you're saying. We're actually doing a filtering, a culling of the genus Pinus because the issue is things like invasiveness and, you know, the propensity to become a problem, right? You guys know what Monterey Pine is? Okay, the classic example. Monterey Pine in California is threatened. It's about ready to go extinct where it naturally grows, right? Plant it in New Zealand or in South Africa, it takes over the flipping country. It's absolutely everywhere and they can't kill it fast enough. It's conquering the entirety of the southern tip of Africa just about in an eucalyptus. So that's the issue. It, does it become an ecosystem problem? You know? And so, but we know that with pines. If they had spent any time looking at, well actually that's how they found it out, right? Started planting Monterey pine and then it's everywhere. They said, ooh. Maybe we need to look at invasibility, and now they've done it. They've screened invasibility for all the species. So there are a bunch of, I think, first steps you need to do, right? Take a, take a look at what are the ecosystem consequences if it does escape, you know? If it's not that big a deal, then why not? You know, for example, um, one of the things that we're doing right now is, um, you, got, you guys, the five needle pines, what do you have here? White bark, okay, white bark, western white you would have had until it all got cut down probably or wiped out. Um, you have western whites around here? Are there some? Um, we have a bunch of them in California as well. You have limber pine? Probably have a limber, right? Those are five needle pines, right? They get nailed by beetles and white pine blister rust kills them. So 
at least with, sugar pine is the biggest one, okay? It's a West Coast species. There are, there's a genotype in sugar pine that's resistant to white pine blister rust, okay? So we are already doing assisted migration of that genotype of sugar pine all over the place. Now we're trying not to put too much of it out there because we know that the rust can evolve uh, resistance to the resistance in the, you know, let you know the way diseases work, right? So that's what we've been looking at, right? Do we have, we know sugar pine's not invasive. We know the kind of habitats it grows in. We have a genotype that's resistant to this disease, and we're already planting it all over the place. And you know what? I bet you there are some of your national forests that already have giant sequoia in them. I bet there are in Montana. I'd be surprised if there weren't. They're all over California. You know how they show the maps and it's only in the southern Sierra? Ha! We got foresters planting that stuff everywhere, man. I mean, they're not supposed to, but it's all over the place, you know? So, at any rate, assisted migration, I think probably we should do where it's safe to do it. We should do it experimentally to see what ends up happening. I, I would suggest that's reasonable. I think the problem is the speed of climate change. Plants will never keep up with it. It's just simply not going to be possible. Um, so, all right, well, I think I'm done. Thank you very much for being such a patient. Talk.